Are you a true crime advocate? Are you passionate about uncovering the truth and bringing justice to victims? Do you love the paranormal and spooky tales? Then you won't want to miss the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival taking place in Austin, Texas from August 25th to the 27th of 2023. This festival features panel discussions, workshops, and live podcasts with a special focus on ethics and advocacy in the true crime sphere. Get your tickets now at truecrimepodcastfestival.com and join us in Austin for an unforgettable experience. Don't miss out on the chance to connect with other advocates and take your passion for true crime and the paranormal to the next level. So book your tickets today at truecrimepodcastfestival.com and be part of this amazing event. Use code CONSEQUENCES to save 15% on your ticket to the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival. Hey, True Advocates, it's me, Eric carter Lundeen. And before we get into the episode, I wanted to give you some context into why we decided to cover this. A lot of people were talking about the June 15th, 2023 Supreme Court decision on Holland versus Brackeen. That case upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a very important act that is related to the sovereignty of the First Nations. Now, Jackie and I were talking one day and she had expressed to me that she wanted to really dive into why the Indian Child Welfare Act was so important to upholding sovereignty for native tribes. And of course, I immediately agreed. And so I want to thank Jackie Moranti for researching and writing this script, but I also wanted to just set the context because this episode is a little bit different from most of the episodes that we do, but it is advocacy related and it does affect New Mexico. And so I'm happy that ICWA was upheld by the Supreme Court. It was the right decision. And I think that you will hopefully learn something as I've learned something through this episode that I'm about to play for you. I'm Eric Carter Landine, and this is True Consequences. On June 15, 2023, the United States Supreme Court made the decision to uphold the Indian Child Welfare Act. This was a very important decision that not only gives the tribes their right to choose who can adopt Native American children, but it also is one of the cornerstones of tribal sovereignty. The relationship between the U.S. government and tribes is hard to understand, and this gives rise to challenges from various special interest groups who view Native tribes as a race as opposed to a political entity. What people don't understand is that Native American law is based on citizenship. Those enrolled in a tribe are citizens of three sovereigns. Firstly, they are citizens of their tribe. Then they are citizens of the United States. And lastly, they are citizens of the state in which they reside. They are considered individuals in an international context and have the rights that are afforded to any other individual in the U.S. To best explain the relationship between the tribes and the U.S. government, we need to go back and look at some history. Tribal nations are sovereign under the law. Treaties and agreements dating back to the 1800s have allowed tribes to have their own governments, their own laws, and even their own nations. In a court case dating back to 1823, Johnson v. McIntosh, the legality of making tribal land grants to private individuals was addressed. The case ruled that tribal people do not have the right to sell their own land and made it law that only the U.S. government could sell native land. In the trial of Cherokee Nation v. Georgia in 1831, there was a lawsuit against the state of Georgia that requested the state jurisdiction didn't apply to Cherokee land. The decision described tribes as domestic dependent nations and the relationship between the federal government and the tribes, quote, resembles that of a ward to his guardian. 
The language is a little tricky, but essentially it granted that tribes were sovereign people, but that the federal government, not the state governments, were trustees of the tribes. Worcester versus Georgia in 1832 maintained that tribal nations didn't lose their sovereign power by becoming subject to the power of the United States. It also maintained that only Congress has overriding power over Indian affairs and the state laws do not apply in Indian country. These were three of the most prevalent agreements that granted Native Americans sovereignty, but also defined the U.S. government's role in overseeing tribal nations. Native Americans weren't granted citizenship in the U.S. until 1924. The Indian Citizenship Act was inspired by the high rate of Native American enlistment during World War I. The first peoples of this country were the last to gain citizenship. Since the states governed the right to vote, many Native Americans weren't allowed voting rights until 1957. In 1879, boarding schools were created. This was a first attempt to assimilate children to the dominant culture. Children were separated from their families under the threat that their parents would either send their children to boarding schools or face prison time and have the rest of their children taken away from them. These children were subjected to extremely harsh treatment, including physical and sexual abuse and malnutrition. Many died of disease, Tuberculosis was a common cause of many children's deaths in those boarding schools. At one point, it was noted that more children died from mistreatment in boarding schools than the number of soldiers who died in the Civil War. The treatment that Native children endured caused generations of trauma and a separation of cultural values, traditional belief systems, and a lack of parental guidance for the survivors of the boarding school era. The ripple effects of this trauma are still felt in tribal communities to this day. The Indian Adoption Act of 1958 allowed government officials to remove Native children from their parents and tribal communities for adoption in non-Native families. Often children were removed from their homes with no evidence of abuse or maltreatment. This was another way that the government chose to exploit children and separate them from their cultural and religious beliefs. The parents nor the tribes had any legal recourse when a child was removed from their home. The law furthered the intergenerational trauma and was a direct precursor to the social problems that we see in tribal communities today. The Indian Child Welfare Act was signed into law in 1978 after studies were done showing that 25% of Native children were being removed from their homes and 87% of those children were being placed with non-Native families. There were more studies being done that showed the Native children who were removed from their culture suffered long-term social problems, such as alcoholism, drug abuse, teen pregnancy, homelessness, and incarceration. The Indian Child Welfare Act is considered the gold standard for child welfare in Indian country. Under ICWA, children can't be removed from the home until there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt that continued parental custody would cause serious or emotional damage to the child. If a child is removed from the home, there must be a first attempt to place that child with a family member. The next attempt, if that failed, would be to place the child with a member of their own tribe. If a tribal member was not available or there wasn't a good option, the final option would be that a tribal member from another tribe would take the child. It's only when all efforts to keep the child within the culture are exhausted that they can be fostered by a non-native family. ICWA wasn't bulletproof though. In 2011, an NPR series found that despite the law being in place, 90% of native children in South Dakota were either placed in group homes or they were placed with non-native families which totally defeats the purpose of the law and opens the door for other legal challenges. There have been several attempts over the years to overturn ICWA. In 2009, Matthew and Melanie Capobianco wanted to adopt a child whose father was a member of the Cherokee Nation. Her mother, Christina Maldonado, was predominantly Hispanic. Baby girl's father, Dustin Brown, contested the adoption on the grounds that he was not properly notified of the adoption under ICWA. Brown won custody in both the trial courts and on appeal to the South Carolina Supreme Court. 
He was given full custody in December of 2011. In October of 2012, the Capo Biancos petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to review the case. The court petitioned the lower court for documents in January of 2013 and heard the case in April of the same year. In June, the Supreme Court issued a 5-4 decision in favor of the Capo Biancos. They didn't overturn ICWA, but they did decide that the non-custodial father had no rights under the law. The case was sent back to South Carolina courts for further hearings on the issue. In July of 2013, the South Car Carolina Trial Court finalized the adoption of the child to the Capo Biancos, but the adoption was stalled in August by the Oklahoma Supreme Court. The stay on the adoption proceedings was lifted in September and the child was turned over to the Capo Biancos. In 2015, the Goldwater Institute filed a class action suit on behalf of all off-reservation Arizona resident children with indigenous ancestry and the foster pre-adoptive and prospective adoptive parents of those children. Carter v. Washburn argued that certain ICWA provisions were unconstitutional and claimed that the indigenous children that were in a state protective custody were being treated with not their best interests at heart, but given substandard, separate treatment based solely on their race. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case and ICWA was upheld. Several attempts to overturn ICWA had been fueled by the Goldwater Institute. They even offered to help the Brackeen family in the most recent case that came before the Supreme Court. The most recent challenge to ICWA began in 2017 when Chad and Jennifer Brackeen, state attorney generals in Texas, Louisiana, and Indiana, sued the Department of the Interior and former Secretary Ryan Zinke. The case was transferred to Devis Bernhardt, who succeeded Zinke as Interior Secretary in April of 2018, and then it was transferred again when Deb Holland was appointed to Interior Secretary in 2021. The Brackeens wanted to adopt a child. Their request was initially denied to the Navajo and Cherokee First Nations. Their request was initially denied, but in 2018, the couple was able to adopt the child after that placement fell through. The child's mother became pregnant again and intended to give the baby up for adoption when she was born. This time, the baby's great aunt was prepared to adopt the child, but the Brackeens wanted to adopt this child as well as the baby boy that they had previously adopted. The Navajo Nation stepped in and gave custody of the child to her great aunt. And this is where the lawsuit began. The plaintiffs, represented by the Goldwater Institute, challenged ICWA was not only race discriminatory, but also violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Fifth Amendment and the Anti-Commandeering Doctrine of the Tenth Amendment. This is a clause in the Constitution that prevents the federal government from requiring states to adopt or enforce federal law. The Cherokee Nation, Oneida Nation, Quinault Indian Nation, and the Marengo Band of Mission Indians intervened as defendants. By 2019, 400 and 86 federally recognized tribes filed an amicus brief to the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals defending the constitutionality of ICWA. In August of 2019, the 5th Circuit Court of Appeals upheld ICWA's constitutionality, but in October of 2019, the plaintiffs requested an in-bank rehearing before the 5th Circuit Court of Appeals. In April of 2021, the court upheld some aspects of ICWA but rejected others. However, overall, they decided that the law was generally constitutional based on the relationship between the First Nations and the U.S. government. This decision pushed the Brackeens to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. On November 9, 2022, oral arguments were held in Brackeen v. Holland challenging the constitutionality of ICWA. The questions presented were whether various provisions of ICWA violate the anti-commandeering doctrine of the Tenth Amendment, whether individual plaintiffs have Article III standing to challenge ICWA's placement preferences for other Indian families and for, quote, Indian foster homes, and whether the default placement preferences for Indian homes in adoption or foster care cases are rationally related to legitimate government interests, therefore consistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the Fifth Amendment. The decision was announced on June 15, 2023, in a 7-2 to decision the court rejected challenges to ICWA that were put forth by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. This decision upheld that ICWA is consistent with the Article I authority of Congress. 
Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch has earned a reputation of being the most knowledgeable justice on questions of Native American history and the most aggressive defender of Native American rights. He wrote in his comments on the decision, quote, The mass removal of children from their family homes in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was only the latest iteration of a much older policy of removing Indian children from their families. One intentionally spearheaded by federal officials with the aid of their state counterparts nearly 15 years ago. In all its many forms, the dissolution of the Indian family has had devastating effects on children and parents alike. It has also presented an existential threat to the continued vitality of the tribes, something many federal and state officials over the years saw as a feature, not a flaw. He concluded by saying, in adopting the Indian Child Welfare Act, Congress exercised its lawful authority to secure the right of Indian parents to raise their families as they please, the right of Indian children to grow up in their culture, and the right of Indian communities to resist fading into the twilight of history. The Brackeens were the headliners in the latest suit, but two other families were involved in the battle. Chad and Jennifer Brackeen and Frank and Heather Liberetti gained full custody of the children they sought to adopt, despite the Supreme Court ruling on ICWA. The third couple, Jason and Danielle Clifford, did not gain custody of the child that they wished to adopt. They had the child's grandmother to contend with. Robin Bradshaw is a member of the White Earth Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, and she refused to give up custody of her granddaughter, known in court documents as P.S., Robin showed up through six years of court hearings and four years of foster care. She was there for P.S. through all of it. Robin was awarded custody of the now 11-year-old P.S. who loves riding bikes and has learned to swim. Her home life is filled with movie nights, cartoons, and coloring, but most importantly, Robin is gathering regalia so that P.S. can attend powwows and she's teaching her the Ojibwe language. P.S.'s story is common among the tribes. It's also the very core of Iqua. Robin bonded with her granddaughter before she was in the womb and was there when she was born. For three years, P.S. was raised by her mother and grandmother in a stable, loving home. Both were full-time caregivers to the child and provided her with food, clothing, and housing. In 2014, that changed. P.S.'s mother fell into drug addiction, and she was unable to care for the child or contribute to household finances. While her daughter was trying to recover from drug addiction, Robin took on the full responsibility of P.S.'s care, but she had limited finances and was eventually evicted from her home. For a while, Robin and P.S. stayed with friends. When an opportunity to gain permanent housing appeared, Robin left P.S. in the care of her father for two days to finalize the move. The father agreed to care for P.S. for a couple of days, but then he disappeared with her and couldn't be found. Robin panicked and called the police. A Child Protective Services report was filed. In August of 2015, Robin learned that P.S.'s parents had been arrested on drug-related charges and P.S. was with them. P.S. had been placed in emergency foster care. Robin immediately called CPS in Hennepin County, where the child was staying, and asked when she could come back and pick her up. But the county told her that she wouldn't be allowed to pick up P.S., and they refused to give her any more information. Robin Bradshaw had been taken from her home as a child to attend a boarding school. She was determined that she would not abandon her granddaughter. For the next six years, Robin showed up to every court hearing, sometimes with a lawyer, sometimes without. She offered any information that the courts needed, and she never stopped asking when P.S. could come home. Every lawyer, every judge, every social worker knew that Robin was P.S.'s Gukumis, her grandmother. Iqua is supposed to ensure that Native children stay in Native homes. Relatives are the first to be contacted when a child goes into foster care. So why couldn't P.S. be given to her grandmother from the beginning? Robin had a 15-year-old felony charge for receiving stolen property. She didn't know that she could have had her record cleared of the charge after so long, no one ever told her that she could do this. Once she found out that her record could be expunged, she did it immediately. That was all she needed to go back and get P.S. in her custody. 
To add insult to injury, the White Earth tribe had indicated that P.S. was not eligible for enrollment in the tribe and was not protected by ICWA. So when her parents lost custody in 2015, P.S. was placed with the Cliffords. The tribe reversed the decision in 2017 and Hennepin County began proceedings to return P.S. to her grandmother. When the adoption was granted in 2020, the court when the adoption was granted in 2020, the court acknowledged that the two years that P.S. had spent with the Cliffords was a positive experience, but they didn't meet the court standards under ICWA to become her adoptive parents. The judge in that case commented that, quote, the Cliffords can provide love, attachment, an active two-family household, and extended family, and ample financial resources, but her grandmother can nurture her, connection to her tribe, to her Ojibwe culture, to her sister, and to both sides of her family in a way that the Cliffords cannot. ICWA is not a racial issue. Tribes are political entities. And individual members are citizens of those entities. This is an issue of sovereignty. The United States government has been tasked with the responsibility of overseeing tribes through agencies like the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Constitution allows tribal nations the same rights under the Tenth Amendment that states have. They are their own government entity, not a special interest group. If ICWA should ever be overturned, sovereignty itself would be threatened. We want to make something completely clear here. The Goldwater Institute is a political organization that does not care about child welfare. Their interests go way deeper than that. They want to eliminate the sovereign status of the tribes for more nefarious reasons. The Goldwater Institute has challenged the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1998, requiring that participation in casino gaming allows the states to negotiate with the tribes to develop gaming compacts, setting forth the games, limits, and other terms. Casino gaming exists on reservations, even in states where gambling is illegal. The Goldwater Institute wants a piece of that pie. They would also like to see the Johnson v. McIntosh decision overturned. If natives could sell their land, especially interests in land where oil and gas are prevalent, the Institute would stand to make millions, if not billions, of dollars from the exploitation of that land. The Indian Child Welfare Act is just the tip of the iceberg. The Goldwater Institute believes that this is the easiest domino to topple in the fight for native rights. If tribal sovereignty ever becomes a question, the First Nations will be faced with several other concerns. Housing, health care, law enforcement, tribal law, culture, language, community, and so much more are at stake. The governmental status of tribal nations is at the heart of nearly every issue that touches Indian country. Self-government is absolutely essential to preserving these cultures. Each tribe has a unique cultural identity, a unique language with unique traditions and beliefs. The U.S. government is responsible for ensuring that these cultural beliefs and traditions are preserved. Children are often regarded as bargaining chips when ICWA is in question. While the court battles rage on, the children are caught in the middle, growing up in uncertainty. The Brackeens and the Goldwater Institute are gearing up for their next battle against ICWA. For the people of the First Nations, that battle may never end. The essence of sovereignty is the ability to govern and to protect and enhance the health, safety, and welfare of each individual citizen of the tribe within tribal territory. Tribal governments have the power to determine their own government structures and enforce laws through tribal courts and police departments. Each tribe exercises these rights through their own distinct forms of government. The way that each determines citizenship, the establishment of civil and criminal laws for their nations, taxing, licensing, regulating, and maintaining and exercising the right to exclude any wrongdoers from tribal lands. As self-governed sovereign citizens who have experienced generations of children being taken from their families, they should have every right to govern the welfare of future generations of children. ICWA guarantees that Native families and Native children will always be considered as individual citizens of their own nation, and they will always be able to observe the cultural and traditional beliefs of those nations. Thanks for listening, and stay safe, New Mexico.